When Jason is away and he invites me to share with his people, I feel honored. And so, Jason, if you watch this video sometime, thank you. It's a privilege to preach in your pulpit. Let me invite your attention this morning to Matthew's Gospel, chapter number 22. <clears throat> Matthew's Gospel, chapter number 22, verses 15 through 22. I'm going to be reading from the New International Version, Matthew 22, verse 15. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap Jesus in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, you hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a Daenerys, and he asked them, whose portrait is on this, and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. Life was hard for the Jews in the first century. The Romans had conquered Judea and Israel like much of the rest of the known world. And although they allowed the Jews to have their own king and to maintain their own religion, the real power belonged to the Romans and their occupying forces. One of the most hated aspects of the occupation was the tax imposed by Rome and the most despised people in all Israel were the Jewish tax collectors who collaborated with the hated Romans. The religious leaders, who were jealous of Jesus' popularity with the common people, conspired to use this political situation to trap him. Tell us, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Now, if Jesus says the Roman tax is unjust and the Jews shouldn't pay it, the religious leaders will report him to the Roman authorities as an insurrectionist who is inciting a rebellion by telling the Jews not to pay taxes to Rome. If he says... They should pay taxes to Rome. The religious leaders will use his words to discredit him and to undermine his popularity with the people. To their way of thinking, it is a perfect trap. No matter what he says, he'll be trapped. But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, you hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a Daenerys, and he asked them, whose portrait is this? And whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, give to Caesar that which is Caesar, and to God that which is God's. With his answer, Jesus not only thwarted the religious leaders of his day, but he made it emphatically clear that believers are citizens of two kingdoms. In our case, we are by birth 
or naturalization, citizens of the United States of America. By regeneration, through faith in the finished work of Jesus, we are also citizens of God's eternal kingdom. Ephesians 2.19 says, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and alien, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household. Philippians 3.20, our citizenship is in heaven. As citizens of the United States, we owe our country our loyalty and our allegiance. As citizens of God's kingdom, we owe God our absolute loyalty and our absolute allegiance. Or as Jesus said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. As citizens of the United States, we have civic responsibilities. As citizens of God's kingdom, we have spiritual responsibility. Our local, state, and federal government provides services necessary for the orderly functioning of society. Things like government agencies, a judicial system, law enforcement, education, roads and highways, and national defense. All these services cost money. And since we are the beneficiaries, we have a responsibility to pay our local, state, and federal taxes. Or as Jesus said, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Paul said it this way, give everyone what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. That's Romans 13, 7. One of the most important civic duties is our responsibility to vote. We should take this responsibility seriously and prayerfully seek the guidance of the Holy Spirit before casting our ballot. Voting is a civic duty we owe our country. Voting in a way that honors God and furthers His purposes in our country is a spiritual responsibility that we owe God. Just last week, I read a survey which says it's estimated that there are going to be 32 million Christians who do not vote. If you're one of those 32 million, shame on you. If you're one of those 32 million, you have abdicated not only your civic responsibility to the United States of America, but more importantly, you have abdicated your spiritual responsibility to God to prayerfully vote in such a way that furthers the cause of God's kingdom here on earth. Now, we know that neither political party is Christian per se, <laughs> and we, of course, know that there are no perfect candidates. Every candidate is a flawed human being with feet of clay. In choosing which flawed candidate to vote for, we should prayerfully consider their party's platform and the candidates' moral values and the choices they have made both in their private lives and in their public service. There are many issues upon which Christians may disagree. Things like welfare reform, immigration, socialized medicine, taxes, the budget, environmental issues, and foreign policy. On these kind of issues, Christians may vote in any number of ways 
without compromising their Christian faith. But, listen to me carefully, there are other issues that are non-negotiable for a Christian. Things like the sanctity of life, which includes the question of abortion. You cannot vote for a candidate or a party who promotes the killing of children before birth without denying your Christian faith. Other non-negotiable issues regarding the sanctity of life include the euthanasia, stem cell research using human embryos, organ harvesting from aborted babies, and human cloning. Other non-negotiable issues for believers include the biblical position on marriage and the biblical position on homosexuality and the biblical position on transgender issues. On these issues, a Christian must vote for the candidate whose position most closely reflects the teaching of Scripture. To do otherwise would compromise our commitment to Christ. Remember, Jesus said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and give to God our absolute allegiance, our total and absolute loyalty, which belongs to God. There are some who would like to argue that you cannot legislate morality, to which I respond that all laws are based on morality. Why are there laws against murder? Because it is morally wrong to murder another person. Why are there laws against perjury? Because it is morally wrong to bear false witness in a court of law. Why are there laws against stealing? Because it is morally wrong to take another person's possession or property. To suggest that you cannot legislate morality is to ignore history. In society where these moral absolutes have been ignored, injustice and human rights abuses abound. In nations where these moral absolutes are core values, injustice and human rights abuses are not long tolerated. That's not to say that the United States has never committed injustice or human rights abuses, for we have. The genocide our government perpetrated on Native Americans in the 19th century is indefensible. Slavery and segregation are equally indefensible. To our credit, we have gone to great lengths to right these unspeakable wrongs. And therein lies the difference between a government based on might alone and a government whose moral foundations hold it accountable to a higher authority. When we call for our nation to return to its moral values and founding principles, we are not excusing those indefensible human rights violations. Rather, we are calling our nation to return to the spiritual principles that gave her the moral strength to fight the civil war, to right the terrible wrong of slavery. And a hundred years later, our spiritual principles gave conscientious citizens the moral strength to defy police brutality, fire hoses, and police dogs to help our African-American brothers and sisters secure the right 
to vote and to integrate our schools and public buildings. Yes, America has committed some terrible injustices, but not because our founding principles were wrong, but because we failed to live up to them. Unfortunately, we are now facing something unlike anything we have ever faced before. Now, the moral absolutes and spiritual principle upon which our nation was founded are under attack. Activist jurors have taken it upon themselves to reinterpret the Constitution of the United States of America. To their way of thinking, it is a living document that can be reshaped to fit their political agenda. Hence, Abortion is no longer the unborn child's right to life, but a woman's right to choose. The Defense of Marriage Act is no longer viewed as a declaration regarding the sanctity of marriage between a man and a woman, but it's now considered an attack on the civil rights of gays and lesbians. The person who dares call homosexuality, a sin, risked being arrested and charged with hate speech. So what is our responsibility in these troubling times as individuals who are citizens both of the United States of America and the kingdom of God? Focus our attention again on the words of Jesus. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God, what is God's? So what does God require of us? We must not be conformed to this world. Romans 12, 2 says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. God requires us to hate what is evil? Romans 12, 9, hate what is evil, cling to what is good. God requires us to overcome evil with good. Romans 12, 21, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. God is requiring us to speak the truth in love even if it is not politically correct. Ephesians 4.15, speaking the truth in love. In the past, we have spoken the truth without love and have been rightly accused of being self-righteous and judgmental. Now, many believers refuse to speak the truth at all, lest they be accused of being intolerant. But both extremes are wrong. Truth without love can be harsh and judgmental, even as love without truth can be permissive. But when we speak the truth in love, it is transformational. C.S. Lewis writes, quote, as Christians... We attempted to make unnecessary concession to those outside the faith. We give in too much. Now, I don't mean that we should run the risk of making a nuisance of ourselves by witnessing at improper times, but there comes a time when we must show that we disagree. We must show our Christian colors if we are to be true to Jesus Christ. We cannot remain silent or concede everything away." End of quote. Voting is a civic duty that we owe our country. Voting in a way that honors God and furthers His purpose in our country is a spiritual responsibility that we owe God. We must ask ourselves, if the positions each political party and its candidate takes on non-negotiable issues 
line up with the clear teaching of Scripture. We must examine their voting records to see how they have voted on these non-negotiable, non-negotiable issues. It's also important to consider who the candidates' friends and supporters are. As my grandma used to say, birds of a feather flock together. Ask yourself, who is Planned Parenthood, the largest abortion provider in the United States, supporting? Who is the Gay Lesbian Coalition supporting? Who are those in favor of same-sex marriage supporting? Regardless of who wins this election or which party is in power, our responsibilities under God remain the same. God requires us to act justly. This is Micah 6.8. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. The Lord requires us to look after the orphans and the widows. This is James. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this, to look after the orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. That's verse 27. What does God require of us? To love Him with our whole heart, mind, and soul, and to love our neighbor as ourself. This is Matthew 22, 37 through 39. Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. The Lord requires us to make disciples. No matter how difficult the times may be, no matter the risk, the Lord requires us to make disciples. Jesus said, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. The Lord requires us to put our trust in Him and Him alone. Psalm 20, verse 7, some trust in chariots and some in horses. That's military might. But we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Isaiah 31 says, woe to those who go down to Egypt for help, who rely on horses, who trust in the multitude of their chariots and in the great strength of their horsemen. But do not look to the Holy One of Israel or seek help from the Lord. God requires us to remain true to the Word of God, no matter how unpopular that may become. Joshua 1.8, do not let the book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. And the Lord requires us to pray and intercede as we have never prayed and interceded before. 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 through 3. I urge then, first of all, that request, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior. And we must vote as if the future of our country depended on it, for it very well may. Now, I can tell you, I've lived long enough to have no illusions 
about politicians or political parties. In my lifetime, I've seen a Republican president forced to resign because of Watergate and a Democratic president whose sexual philandering while in the White House has forever tainted his legacy. The bribes, the kickbacks, and the sexual scandals on both sides of the aisle are too numerous to detail. And at times, the level of incompetence has simply been staggering. I mention this not to speak disparagingly of our elected officials, but only to remind you that there are no ideal candidates and no ideal parties. And even as we fulfill our responsibilities as citizens, our hope must remain in God and in God alone. Paul said in the last times, There'd be perilous times, and surely we're living in them. Jesus said, except those days be shortened, the very elect would be deceived. And then he said, don't let your heart fail you for looking at those things that are coming to pass upon the earth. He said, I have overcome the world. Trust in me. Then he said, when all of these things begin to happen, look up, for your redemption draweth nigh. Even as we fulfill our responsibilities to our country and to our God, we must look up because our redemption is drawing nigh and Jesus is our only hope. Let me end with this. A story shared by the late contemporary Christian artist Rich Mullen. During a downtime, he'd been spending some time hiking the Appalachia Trail. And after some weeks on the trail, he came down and noticed a a village not too far off, and he decided a hot meal would be good, so he hiked into town. As he was eating his dinner, A fellow customer came and sat down beside him, and they struck up a conversation. When the meal was finished, the customer noticed how weary Rich Mullins looked and said to him, hey, how about I give you a ride back to the trailhead? Oh, and Rich said, wow, that would be great. So they got in the car and started heading back toward the trailhead. And the uh, driver said to him, Rich, I suppose I ought to tell you I'm a homosexual. And Rich says, I suppose I ought to tell you I'm a Christian. And the guy put the brakes on, pulled the car off over to the side of the road, and he said, I guess you want to get out. (laughs) And Rich said, no, why why would I want to get out? And he said, because I'm homosexual, and all Christians hate homosexuals. And Rich said, I'm a Christian. I don't hate you. Then he said to him, well, you may not hate me, but you believe I'm going to hell because I'm a homosexual. And Rich says, no, I don't. Listen to me now. Nobody goes to hell because of what they do. If you go to hell, it will be because of what you didn't do. And then he quoted John 3, verses 16 through 18. For God so loved the world, and he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Then verse 17, for God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And then verse 18, for whosoever does not believe in him is condemned already because he hath not believed in God's only begotten Son. If any of us go to hell, 
It will be because of what we didn't do. Because we did not believe in God's only begotten Son. Because we did not trust Him for our salvation. Just a moment, we're going to pray. And perchance you're here this morning. And you've never believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. You've never asked Him to forgive your sins and be your Savior. After we pray, I'm going to give you an opportunity to make the most important decision you'll ever make in time or eternity. I'm going to give you a chance to call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Let's pray.